So it was taking back where we left off, but like, who is reviewing these things? So it's being reviewed by other researchers. I forgot to sort of mention, let's start this thing, that a big part of the grant strategy, and one thing that makes it easier for you than articles, is that so a panel that reviews grants will have about 25 people on it. So these are mostly, this is why these are held in large and undistinguished hotel ballrooms. And you get stuff from everywhere. Like we get stuff mostly in aging, child human development, mental health. We get a lot of nursing, um, a lot in cancer. You get stuff from everywhere. But you get, you have 25 people to review about 80 proposals. And each proposal will have at least one person who's really an expert review it. But the other two often have a level of ignorance about the topic area that is, I don't know how to say it without seeming ungracious. <laughs> well, let's, let's just say that, yeah, I, you know, if you get assigned something that you're totally not competent to review, you just tell the person, I can't do it, and they'll give you something else. But they assume that most of what you review is outside of your content area and outside of your expertise, but that as a reviewer, you have a global, they say you're experts in science. And I'm like, well, okay, that's nice you say about that, so sure. But you know, you have a global expertise. So what this means is your article will be reviewed by two or three or four experts. Your grant will be reviewed by one expert who's hard freaking core. And frankly, if you look, at the list of people who reviewed the grants, you could probably know exactly who that is. Just like, I submitted something on medical sociology using that person's model. <laughs> oh, whoa, that person's on there. <laughs> what a crazy coincidence. So they invite people to cover all the main domains. So you have one expert and two people who are very open to being persuaded about why this work is awesome. So a lot of what I review, some of it I'm clearly meant to be the expert guy because like it's, I do a lot of experience sampling work, ecological momentary assessment, and anything on that I'm probably the first person. But then there's a lot of stuff that is on the fringe of my expertise, you might say. And so what this means is I really just want people to tell me why this is awesome because I'm not invested in it, I don't know a whole lot about it, I'm really open to persuasion. So this is why you have a bit of an edge with grants, because if you are persuasive and really make a case for its strengths and why it's important, you really win over two of the three reviewers <laughs> sort of fairly easily, because you want to be sold. Like, they're always on the, the, the researcher side a little bit. They wish more people could get funded. And you just make your case. Like, it's easy to, it's easy to sell people who don't have a lot of skin in the game. So this is one thing that actually makes grants a little bit easier than, than articles, is that you're dealing with people who are experts globally, but they don't know a lot about your area. So you could really sauce it up for them and make it sound sort of great. I'll also mention, as part of our cynicism thing, NIH has conflict of interest policies for grant reviews, which are scary. And only the way that the federal government can be scary. Like, really <laughs> serious. You have to sign something pre-meeting, you have to sign something at the meeting, you have to sign something after the meeting. They go on and on about like the perjury penalties and like all the scary FBI guys will come to your house and set fire to it. <laughs> and it's very serious and there's like, you can't review anything by anyone at your institution, by any former student, anyone who you've worked with for a few years, anyone who you think you might work with. And then what's sometimes called the disgruntled congressman rule, but not by them, but by the reviewers, because the people at NIH are far too diplomatic. But rather, if, because you know it occasionally happens that like some congressman just for some reason is like really upset that the federal government is spending tax taxpayer dollars to like encourage science and knowledge and human health. And they just like pull out some proposal and they say, oh, this is retarded, this is so stupid. Like, if you think some irascible congressman would think you have a conflict of interest, then you can also recuse yourself. You can recuse yourself for any reason, and they encourage it. And in fact, the incentives are there for you to do it, because when you can't take partner review, 
you have to leave the room, which means you can like go to the bathroom and get coffee and hang out and have a break. <laughs> so I think at least half of the recusals are of these soft recusals, where I think this is maybe one where I should, yeah. So, and it's hardcore. The computer system is set up so that you never know the scores of those. I mean, you, you have no information whatsoever about it. Like, they take this stuff very seriously, as they should. I mean, it's really a, an, a wonderful model for peer review. It's very fair. So, our other question. What makes an idea good for a grant? I'm not really sure. It's kind of tough. I should have more to say about this than I do. Um, it's hard to say because this is very abstract. Like, what makes an idea good? Like, what makes it compelling? There's a few tricks, though, that I have to say, like serving on these panels so many times has sort of sharpened my sense of the, maybe the kinds of things people are looking for and has changed my thinking on grants actually quite a bit, I have to say. And so here's a couple things I would say. And the first is I think most people, when they're first starting out with grants, and they're trying to come up with an idea for their first grant proposal, they, they intuitively kind of think, what we might say forward about it. So what they think is they think, OK, I do research on this topic. I know how to do this stuff, and I'm passionate about this. I want to do this kind of work. I have these people to help, and I have these facilities and these tools. So I'm going to pitch this. Now, it sounds natural, but that is like wrong. Like you want to put yourself several years in the future into like some fantasy, utopian, like paradisical state where you think, OK, it's a few years from now. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend. I can buy out of my, my classes. I can pay for a bunch of grad students. I can hire postdocs. I have the money to pay co-investigators and collaborators tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars to help me with this stuff every year. I've got a freakish amount of money in a lot of years to do almost anything I want to do. So then, what would you do? So I think thinking backwards is the key. Like people, it sounds counterintuitive because the way we do research when we don't have grants is this way of, what do I know how to do? Who's the people who can help me? What are the skills I have? Like what infrastructure and equipment's available here? What's realistic giving my teaching? And so people will write that for a grant, but grants tend to have a much larger scope for reasons we'll talk about later. So you want to think sort of scaled up, like think ambitious, like something that has crazy grab, crazy scope, really kind of saucy and salacious. So if you had all of this money, what would you really like to do? And this, I think, helps chisel people out of this mindset. It helps people think, OK, actually, if I did have, I mean, if you have all this money, you could get more space in the building. You could get a lot of graduate students. You could get postdocs. You could buy all the equipment you want. You have a lot of money for traveling. Like people who know how to do things that you simply can't do will totally jump in there to help you. Stuff that you might not normally do, like you might do research with just a single time point. But now you have two or three or five years. So you could do it longitudinally. It might never occur to you to collect, say, biological assays or biological data because it's very expensive. But you could totally do that because you have the money, but you don't know how to do that. But there's probably someone who works here who does. Co-investigator, put him in there. So thinking backwards, like imagining like untold riches, <laughs> which it's quite a bit less for this side of the room than for this side of the room. <laughs> you know, $8,000. <laughs> you, know, so, you, know, you know what I mean. So just like think. That's actually really a lot of money to me, I have to say. So you know, it's really, it's not a small number. So like, so really like just think total grandiose abject fantasy. Like that's, even if you don't pitch that, it will sort of make you think, yeah, what if it was longitudinal? I don't really know how to do that. But there's people here who do longitudinal work. And if you ask anyone who's like a friend and a competent researcher, hey, we're getting a proposal together. Do you want to be a consultant or co-investigator? They'll say, yes, because they're getting paid and they can buy out of teaching. And most of the time, you know, if there are people up for collaborating, they can help. So 
more measures, interesting samples, more years, more people, more scope, all of these kinds of things. Think of what you would do then. Think of what you'd do then. So it's like, don't propose what you would normally do. Propose some like crazy steroidal version <laughs> of what like, maybe comes, comes naturally. And that kind of takes us to the second one of think huge, think large in scope. This is a grim way of expressing sort of thinking big, but you know, the kind of stuff that gets good scores tends to be it tends to have a kind of a scope and a comprehensiveness. And in as much as anything can be definitive, it has a definitiveness to it. So work can be big in a couple ways. So it can be big in that it has more years rather than fewer years. It has more people involved rather than fewer people involved. More participants rather than few. More kinds of measures like self-report, peer report, community report, teacher report, psychophysiological, biological, archival, what have you, rather than fewer. Um, it's, in a sense, complicated. So this is the kind of thing that people on the panels, it tends to excite them. Because in the same reason that fantasy movies like Lord of the Rings are exciting, because like, God, that seems like total fantasy. That would never work. Wow. Like, like, it's easy to excite people with something that's so ridiculously massive and complicated. You're like, that's so cool. And you're sort of thinking, wait, they haven't actually done it. It might totally fail. But wow, what if they did? You know, so people are just naturally attracted to these kinds of things. But part of it is like the peculiar economics and reviewing of grant proposals that this is not research that anyone has done. This is something that they would like to do, and they would like the government to give them money to do. And as a reviewer, I'm not sure the right way to put it, you, know, like you clearly are not funding proposals. You're evaluating their scientific merit. And in a sense, it's always easy to be loose with other people's money, especially when that other person is spending $23 billion a year funding research. So like from a reviewer's point of view, like, it's not my four and a half million dollars they're asking for. Like, it seems, and then, in a sense, perfectly sensible. Like, instead of asking for a couple years to do a few things to a few people, something much more comprehensive, that's much more expensive, and that offers so much more information that can be mined by them and for other people for many years, really seems like a better value for the money. Like, a lot of beginners, they cheap out. They kind of think, I want to be a good value. I'll have a better chance because you know fewer years, less money, because they'll see they're getting a lot of knowledge for their buck. But the people, again, like who's actually reading it, the people actually reading it, what you're sort of thinking is you're thinking, will this work happen? Will this work work, given the time they have? And if someone is asking for more money and has more personnel, so more co-investigators, more postdocs, more graduate students, so more people, more money, more years, it seems more certain that it'll actually be executed and happen. Because really the worst thing that can happen is someone gets money for a proposal and the work does not get done. That is a disaster. And so feasibility is one of the biggest issues that comes up with evaluating grants. Like can this team pull it off given what they're proposing, what they're asking for? So that's one of the reasons why you, you think and pitch big. Because it just looks like, yes, this will happen. Because as we all know, when you have so many people involved, like what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, <laughs> sort of irrational, but so big. So big in scope. What this means is that a lot of the proposals people do end up being collaborative. That for people to do work that's, that stretches their own abilities, typically what's happening is that they're collaborating with other people. And I think with a group like this, there's, like a, there's really a lot of natural pairings. So sociologists and anthropologists and public health workers and psychologists and nurses, that there's a lot of shared interests and a lot of shared overlap, but also a lot of unique expertise, right? Like some people are good at statistics, some are good at some methods, some know how to access special samples, some just are really good with the nuts and bolts of biological measures, some people are good with the nuts and bolts of managing a multi-year longitudinal project. And 
these kinds of complementary strengths are what make a proposal really attractive. So having a, a big team that sort of complements each other is just really tight. In a sense, a way you can think about it, it seems so irrational, and it seems like it shouldn't matter, but you really just want to come across as, we would never do this without this grant. Like, this is just not work that can be done without a grant. Like, to have a sense of urgency, you really need to look like you need the money. It feels unfair to think this about a proposal, but there are some proposals you get, like say someone's doing experimental laboratory research with college students, you think, you know, this might be the kind of thing they've already done. Like, you don't need a grant to do this. It's going to happen anyways if they want to do it. They don't need the funding, but there's all this other great work that really has to have it. And it's maybe a bit of a tacit kind of judgment at the back of people's minds. Like, a longitudinal community mental health thing, it needs the money. You, you just can't do large-scale longitudinal work in the community without the money. Some stuff you can, so you always maybe give a bit of a lean to the people who need it. Like, sometimes people will say these meetings like, man, it'd be great to see this work get done. Or like, this is work that has to happen. And you just sort of know that like there's more of a sense of urgency to it. So I guess it means look desperate, look poor. I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but you wanna just look like, <laughs> yes, like you have to have the cash to pull this off because it's big and intricate and awesome. Now that takes us then to the dark world of mechanisms. Now I'm not, I know you guys have had some other speakers come in and people from NIH like, how familiar are people with these crazy things? Our ones, you have heard of it. Some, um, yeah. Yeah, this is its own. The federal government, of course, there, there's no free lunch. There was sort of today, actually. The <laughs> government paid for it. But you know, nothing in this life is ever free, except for the stuff that you don't have to pay money for. So there, yeah, so anyway, so. Part of the joys of, of grant writing is the weird like lingo and language and it drives people insane. For NIH grants, there's really four what they would call research grants. And so because they are research grants, they start with R. The career awards start with K for career. It's <laughs> It's the German, it is. I mean, it's, it's common sense, really. So, I don't really, it's just one of these things. It's okay, we're not criticizing because they give us money and we're very happy that they do this. They're actually a fine institution. So, the R, research grants. There's really four kinds that you could apply for. The most common, without a doubt, and we'll kind of spend the most time on these, is the R01 and the R21. So of the research awards, these are, these are the most common in the sense that the most, these are the most submitted kinds of mechanisms. And as a result, most of the money is going to these mechanisms. So the R01 is your standard off-the-shelf research grant. This is kind of your large research grant. They're insanely competitive. It's a lot of money. So this is the big one. So you can ask for up to half a million dollars a year for five straight years. You don't have to ask for five years worth, and you don't have to ask for half a million a year. You could even ask for more per year. You'd have to get special permission, and they would probably give you a sad shake of the head and say, seriously, don't get greedy. <laughs> like, but generally speaking, people are asking for five years and a lot of money because they are thinking big and you need to, these have large teams, a lot of personnel. I mean, just think of the kind of project you would do if you had five years, four really good helpers who had PhDs, a postdoc, and two million dollars. Like you would think of something like really crazy killer, possibly involving those, those monster elephants. <laughs> so these are very competitive. I think about half of what we review are R01s. I think about half of what NIH gets overall is R01s. It's extremely competitive because you're competing with everybody. Everyone who works at the med schools, all of these crazy like monster center leaders from all over the nation 
Like you're competing with everyone in the nation for this kind of money. But as a young investigator, if this is if you've never had an R01, or if you're less than 10 years out of your PhD, you do have two edges on these. And one is which, when they're determining your percentiles, they will give you a, a two percentile bump, which is a lot, <laughs> actually. This, because when they're funding up to the 18th or so percentile, and you're at the 19th or 20th, you're like, Ksh. and you say, take that old stodgy old timer, <laughs> a new generation's in town. So that's one sort of edge. Another edge is at the panels. So the panels start by reviewing all the R01s. They take all the R01s that are by young investigators and early stage investigators, and they talk about those first. Now, this is a big <laughs> edge because people are not depressed and beaten down and crushed because these meetings, I'm telling you, I mean, they last from 8 in the morning until 6 at night. And they're run by these horrible federal government taskmasters. Like, well, we've been working really hard. Let's take a half hour lunch break. <laughs> and then like, so it's eight to six, and then the next day, eight to about one. It's, so to get people when they're at their, they're happy to see each other, they're alert, they're fresh, it's, it's a huge edge. I mean, it really is. And this is done explicitly so that more of these get funded. I mean, there's, so that's like pretty helpful. For most people, this is not going to be the first NIH grant they submit. And that's, that's cool. Like, don't aspire to it necessarily. Like, it's, it's very competitive. And these other mechanisms are sort of well suited for getting your foot in the door. The RO3 is the small grant. And they kind of mean small grant. So it's for two years. You can ask for one year of funding or two years of funding. Crazy people ask for one year because I can't possibly imagine why you would ever do that. Because the proposal isn't half as long. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so well, actually why anyone would ever ask for less than the maximum is mind boggling. And almost nobody does it. So two years, 50,000 a year. So two years, $100,000. That sounds like a lot of money, but it's very little. You really can't do a whole lot on $50,000 a year. Because part of what you're doing with a grant is you're paying for some of your own salary. So you're committing time to the project. And the way that you show that you're committing your time is you're using the grant to buy out some of your salary, maybe 10%, 15%, 20%, 30%. You might feel shy about doing this, but you should not. Because grants are about flamboyant, hypomanic grandiosity. They are not about humility. And from the reviewer's point of view, like the most common criticism when it comes to this would be, I'm not sure they have enough skin in the game. How are they going to really pull this off at only 5% of their time spent on it? Like you want to put a lot of time into it so that you're showing that like, I'm committed, I'm carving out time, I'm accountable, I'm in it. And a happy byproduct of that is you're paying yourself more money for it. So everyone wins, I guess. So 50,000 is not very much. Because if it's you and another investigator, there's some personnel, you might be paying participants. And so this is a mechanism that I, just my own opinion for its worth, is actually kind of skunked. I'm not, it's not one I really recommend, as you'll see some of the others are better. Because not a lot of them get submitted anymore, because it's hard to do something really compelling. If you do have something really compelling, the reviewers say, why not just send one of these where you could do it really well? And most of the ones that get good scores come from people who have a monster grant and they want to do an add-on. Yes, you might not think of this, but seriously, this is what happens. Like almost every RO3 that really gets a good score is, we've got this really great longitudinal project on, uh, let's just say, smoking cessation among Hispanic youths in El Paso. And we want to add, let's just think of something so ridiculous, it probably never fly. We want to add a genetic component. So we've had this R01 for two years. It's ongoing. It's a five-year project. We have this new person who's like a molecular geneticist. But we want to collect genetic data. And it would cost about $90,000 to do that. So we're going to submit an R03. And we're going to ask for $100,000 so we can collect genetic data as part of a big study we already have. So what's happening is people are leveraging their big, awesome monster projects 
to get a bit of extra money to add something onto it. People who have a standalone small project tend to get sort of killed. So this takes us to these. The R21s account for about half of what we get to. Like, they get a whole bunch of these at NIH. It's probably, it's the second most popular one. And these are called exploratory slash developmental research projects. Those of you who are really interested in English style would also wish they did not use slashes like that. I mean, it just seems like, it's just tacky, and William Zinser in On Writing Well would denounce it. He would also say it's called a virgule, not a slash. Slash was the guitarist for Guns N' Roses. It's not a punctuation mark. But anyways, exploratory developmental. So this is two years up to $275,000 total. You can ask for the money only in $25,000 blocks because it's just not worth it for them to keep records for less than that. So you could ask for 200,000, turn 25,000, turn 50,000, turn 75,000, spread over these two years. Usually it's 150, 125. And already, now that we are thinking big and thinking grandiose, we're thinking, why would we propose two years, 100,000? Well, we get two years, 275,000. And the world is thinking the same way since we get only a couple of these and a ton of these. So the exploratory developmental projects are a cool mechanism because the idea is to get some pilot data, some preliminary data, a proof of concept data, some early initial data, something high risk, high reward is how they call it. Like something risky, maybe a little bit out there that if it works, would serve as the basis for a really large multi-million dollar five-year grant. So these, these are great, because this is where you can sort of try out an idea that's riskier. You don't need preliminary data, although people often have it. This is, you can pitch an idea that's maybe a little bit out there, but part of the idea is that if it works, you can develop it in something bigger, more comprehensive, more cool, and more awesome. These make a really great first proposal. Because first of all, if you get it, I mean, it's a crazy amount of money. I mean, it can be hard to spend that much money in a couple of years. You will, however, find ways. <laughs> but like, it's, it's kind of cool. So one example, so we have one of these at the moment. And so we, were, we are interested, one of the things we do is we do psychotherapy outcome trials, where we explore new psychotherapies, either conditional, traditional psychotherapies done like in a, psych, in a psychology clinic with psychotherapists and clients. There might be a couch. Usually there's just state contract chairs which aren't that comfortable. And so we're interested in one kind of emerging psychotherapy for depression that seems to work well for people for whom traditional cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't work. So yeah. So we would like to do a really big scale clinical outcome trial to see, does it work overall? For whom does it work? How do you predict for whom it works? It's the kind of thing that would take five years and millions of dollars, but they would not give you that grant because they want to get some sense of, can you pull this off? And is there some early sense that you're right? Like they would rather give you a quarter million dollars for a couple of years to try out the idea and then give you, you know, two and a half million dollars to really do it, then give you two and a half off the start. So it's kind of, um, these are kind of hedging a little bit. So it's great as an investigator. The proposal is six single space pages. It's kind of awesome. It makes my friends in the humanities bitter because they'll fill out these like 20 page fellowship proposals to get $8,000. <laughs> And so they can go visit, you know, some, some place in Paris, which is, you know, has its virtues. But so, not a long proposal. You, the idea can be kind of flamboyant. Try something out. It's a good way to sort of get your foot in the door. This is, I think, the thing I would really encourage you to start looking at for your first proposal. But our final mechanism, one that's off the map for a lot of people, not as widely advertised, is R15s. So this is called an area, which stands for Academic Research Enhancement Award, because it's all about the acronyms at the federal government. Um, I'm really quite sure UTEP is eligible 
So to be eligible for these, the goal is that it's a research grant that can involve students in a meaningful way. Because quite a lot of research shows that students who go on to careers in the sciences come from places like UTEP and UNCG. Students who go to Harvard and Yale go into law and finance. They don't go into the sciences. So it's schools like this that send the students into the sciences. When you work at schools like this, you see it. You see it. So they want to invest in schools that are doing a good job of training undergraduate students in the sciences. And they are particularly delighted when this is a school that is sending members of groups that are traditionally underrepresented in the STEM fields into the sciences, which would be a place like here, right? So you can get 100000 a year for three years. It's really a lot of money. It's pretty good. It's for a regular research project, but in judging the impact of it, you're judging its scientific impact, and also how well is this engaging undergraduates in research? What's the training going to look like? What are the outcomes going to look like? Are students going to be attracted to this project? Are they going to want to do it? Like, what are you really going to do with them so that this is, this is good? So it's part training grant, part research grant, but they say it's not a training grant, but there's all these parts where you talk about training parts, but it's not a training grant, so you don't talk about training parts. And they are somewhat confused about these. This is a, a big initiative of NIH. They've had these forever but they're hoping to rejuvenate them. They have a new director of this program. They recently kicked the dollar amount from 50,000 to 100,000. The new director, Erica Brown, is seriously gung-ho, extremely helpful if you ever wanted to call her and talk about it. All the websites got overhauled. The program announcement got overhauled. They have helpful videos and things on the internet to talk about it. And they have a list of schools that are ineligible. And I looked on the web page. UTEP's not ineligible. Uh, because to be ineligible, the component of your institution has to get something like more than six million a year from NIH in four of the last seven years. So often a medical school of a university will be ineligible, but other components won't be. And it's just from NIH, so NSF, Department of Defense, foundations doesn't doesn't count in these totals. So. A virtue is you're competing not with Harvard and with Duke, the University of Virginia, um, UT Austin, places like that. Like you're, the pond is kind of a bit more fair. And they, they really care about how undergrads will be treated. Yes? What, is, what was the acronym again? What is it Area, Area, uh, Academic Research Enhancement Award. It's a strange acronym. It seems not totally related to what it's about. But food for thought. <laughs> Food for thought. I think in particular, most students who graduate and go into academics, I mean, most people work at area eligible institutions. And so most of you who are not faculty yet will work there. Really very certain that you guys are eligible. We're eligible at UNC Greensboro. This makes a fantastic first grant too. I mean, it's, the hit rates are not necessarily better, but you can make a nice pitch because when you work at a place that has a good history of involving undergraduates, and that also is working with undergraduates who are first generation, maybe racial ethnic minority, um, they are very strongly committed to encouraging diversity in, in STEM fields, and it's great, it's really great. A final brief issue would be, should I go for requests for proposals, or should I go for what are called investigator-initiated awards? So a request for a proposal is NIH says, hey, send us proposals on this topic. And people go, OK. And they send them proposals on that topic. If that's what you study, you should send it. But for the most part, this is really overrated. Because unless you exactly study that perfectly, you're competing against people who study that perfectly. And they will get it, and you won't. It's that simple. Investigator initiated is everything else. It's all this stuff. It's like, here's my idea. Like, you're creating your own request for proposals. You're saying, here's my idea. It is awesome and urgent. So I think you have a stronger sales case when you just pitch the own ideas that you're passionate about 
that you and your team are the experts on. Because statistically, it's unlikely that a request for a proposal is exactly what you do. But it's likely it's exactly what someone else does. And they know that. And they're putting in for it. And they'll get it. That's just my own, that's just my own two cents. Yes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Very, very little. I mean, they give so much money each year. Very little of it is for these. And part of it is because NIH and NSF and most agencies have a, a good sense of how innovation works. It works from the bottom up. You basically say, broadly, here's what we care about. We have a National Institute for Health Disparities. We care about health disparities. Send us your best ideas on this. So by encouraging innovation from the bottom up, you're going to get just incredible ideas that it would never occur to you as the government to fund. But occasionally, they get things they really care about and they want someone to do. And so they'll do a request for a proposal. Like we put one in for, it was understanding the impact of deployment on the families of reservists. Because reservists are a very understudied group. They, I mean, it's. Their lives were disrupted in many ways quite a bit more. They don't have a lot of social support. And so it was like a joint RFP between the Veterans Administration and NIH. It means people put something in. They were like, ah, no. They were just like, your proposal was bad. Um, you probably, if you did this work, veterans would probably suffer as a result. So <laughs> like, you know, there's a, it got really. They really said that. <laughs> no, they didn't. But it was. <laughs> They, they were not interested. And that's OK. That's OK. But so a very small amount of money is them saying, man, we really want to know this. But most of it is just innovate. Be creative. Tell us. Send us your best ideas. And so really all of the money is here. And it's your chance to create excitement and enthusiasm among them about what you care about, rather than try to fit into something that they care about. Sense. So finally, I would just say the same thing for grants as for articles. You got to resubmit these suckers. At NIH, you can only resubmit once. And this is a blessing because at the National Science Foundation, you could resubmit over and over and over like an obsessive compulsive shut in. <laughs> and you can resubmit these things six times and seven times. And the program officers there are way too embedded in peer review and way too influential. And it gets creepy and inbred. NIH is, send it. You'll get comments back. You can send it again. And I think you should virtually always resubmit it. So what will happen is with your proposal, it'll either get unscored, meaning it was in the bottom worst 50 percent, or it'll get scored. You'll get a number between like 10 and 45, 10 being best, 45 or so being worst. It's hard to find a number where you're going to get funded. Generally speaking, 25 to 10. I mean, 10 is, is perfect. You will get funded. But 25, 20 to 10 will definitely get funded. Like, it's the kind of thing you ask your program officer about, and they'll tell you. But so if it's not great, Resubmit it. Um, but yes. that you said doesn't get scored? About 50% doesn't get scored. Okay. Yeah, about, so about 50. So the idea is in your long and dismal day and a half in the Bethesda you know, embassy suites, you can still only talk about 40 of the 80 that you got. And for that, we are thankful, because then you'd be there for three days. So these get preliminary scores before the meeting. Um, they are simply rank ordered by these preliminary scores, and you just talk about half of them, essentially. There's some complexities to it, um, some things that aren't at the top half. If anyone wants to talk about you can talk about. Um, if a proposal got two bad scores but one great score, we would also talk about it. But for the most part, half don't get talked about. That's OK. You can still resubmit it. I mean, there's ideas in there. I mean, I, I think unless the comments are incredibly hostile, and damning, and you would never, ever do the things they suggest you do, you should resubmit it. Because some stuff sticks the first time, but most stuff gets funded on the resubmission. 
Now, resubmitting grants is not like articles. And I will say the time on the panels has shown this is where people so lose it in like a bad and horrible way that is frankly embarrassing. So with a journal article, the research is done and you can't change anything. And if it has limitations, that's just what it has. And you're just trying to make a case to the editor like, hey, sure, yeah, OK, we couldn't randomly assign people to conditions. This is community-based work. You do what you can sometimes. It, it can, it's the basis for something later that does. For a grant proposal, this research has not been done. And also, it's up to you. You can, you can still do it. You're just asking them for money to do it. And that changes the nature of these things a lot. So for example, most of the criticisms really that come in have to do with the work's scope. It's either, we don't think this is feasible. That means, great, <laughs> we're going to ask for more years and more money. Cool, OK. Or it's like, the scope's too small. Add investigators, add measures, add outcomes, add samples. Or this would be better if you did this with clinical samples rather than this. OK, we'll do that. So really, you should sort of aim to almost do everything that you can that's suggested. Because when a resubmission is reviewed, you're explicitly asked to talk about, like, was this responsive is the word. Was this responsive to the prior reviews? And there's really only one answer you can have to that, which is really responsive. And part of the reasons are sort of social psychological, where you have a lot of people in a room, they're a little dejected because they're like trapped there, and the coffee at the embassy suites is only marginal. And it's been a long time. And you remember this proposal, and 25 people spent some time talking about it and giving suggestions to to the researchers, and the researchers sometimes just come back and they argue the points, like in a journal, like, like this many an article. As a reviewer, you think, look, you can do it, but this is, like, we think this for a reason. Like, this is a huge group of 25 people, like, like we thought, you know, fairly serious about this, and we could be, like, really wrong, too. But you're asking for, like, our opinions on this, and that's what we said. So. It could be pretentious, it could be stentorian, it could be wrong, but that's just kind of like how it is. And so when someone comes out and says, this is a resubmission, blah, 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 ah, it wasn't very responsive. I mean, you can just get this like dark tone in the room where people just kind of go, ah. And the mood turns sour, because already you sort of feel like, God, this is taking a lot of time. And then you think, man, these people are wasting our time. Like, but then on the other hand, like, really, most of what you get is like proposals that are really responsive. And the person starting off the review said, wow, this proposal was really responsive. Like, they, they really took this stuff very seriously. And the mood in the room is like, oh, good. Like, these people are really trying. So if at all possible, change everything. So one thing we submitted, this is actually a clinical trial. The first time we submitted it, it got a score of 40 close to around 45 where you wouldn't get discussed. We also got a human subjects protections unacceptable tag, which means we're kind of like, like they're afraid this is going to turn into like the Tuskegee Airmen experiment, <laughs> basically. And <laughs> it was pretty funny. I did learn from this that you can still get funded because our resubmission also got a human subjects protections unacceptable tag. <laughs> That was embarrassing, but you know. <laughs> you can work things out post-review too. Anyway, so, and they just said, you need to add a condition to this. And our first thought was, in two years, we're trying to run this many people. It, we can barely do it. We can't ask for any more money. We're already asking for the max. So you want us to run twice as many people with the same number of staff, the same amount of time, the answer is, of course, got it. Yeah, going to do it. Check. Like, you just got to make it happen. And they said, you know, really need to include this. Like, well, we don't know much about that. But someone's old graduate mentor did that. Consultant, $1,000 a year for two years, check. And who's going to train the psychotherapist? Former graduate mentor, doesn't live that far away. 
pay him as a consultant a thousand a year. And so we just, we did everything and we just wrote, you only get one page to talk about what you did. We said, we did that and 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 we did that. And so the resubmission got a 20. They got funded at 20. And they just said, I mean, service protections was still unacceptable. But this is, um, I mean, it's, it's a trial with moderately and severely depressed community adults. The risk of self-harm is like really great. And a lot of, I mean, a lot of issues in this work are extremely complex. And we obviously, according to them, don't understand it very well. Probably right. But you know, so you, that, that is like maybe the best tip for resubmission. Just try to change everything if you think you can legitimately do it. That's just how this kind of stuff works. And for that, we will maybe end with the grim talk of grants. Are there any questions I can answer about grants? It's a topic that makes the energy in the room deflated and discouraged. There's nothing like 18% funding rates. Just change everything according to the caprices of these cruel and fickle reviewers. But yes. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. So I will tell you, so um, I'll definitely resubmit it. One of the curious things about these panels is there's a crazy amount of turnover. So about a third of the members are permanent, which means that they've agreed to do it every time, three times a year for four straight years. And they get really nothing for this except for bragging rights or your university will flog you if you don't do it. Anyway, so, um, and the others are ad hoc. It might be just that time. It might be people like me who do it two or three times a year for many years. Um, but it's really rare that you get all three people. You might get one of them. You probably would. But you might not get the other two. It actually happens all the time that I was a reviewer on something that came in before and wasn't any reviewer at all the next time. It's just the way these things shake out. So you, as a reviewer of resubmission, you can see the prior comments. You don't know who those people were either, but you can see the prior comments. So you can get a sense of whether they were handled. But so for a resubmission, you want to address the comments, but you're also not writing for the same people. It might be just one of those same people. And if it's going to be anyone, it's going to be the first person, typically. So it helps to know that the reviewers of the resubmission aren't super personalized in it because they might not agree with that person either. Like this happens all the time. Like I see two people like it, one hate it. And I'm like, I think that person was thinking about it the wrong way too. Like they're overthinking this problem. They have to start somewhere. And so you can always respectfully disagree and point to the strengths. Maybe there's some small change you could make just to show there's some concession that's happening. Um, one thing that's special with R15 starting last year was they're reviewed by their own panels now. Like actually this started just a couple, a few months ago. And this is so that the hit rates get better. So I think you're less likely to get really crazy reviews, hopefully. But indeed, all kinds of questions. Yes. question about the feasibility. Yes. Um, It is a magical math, I will tell you. How does that come into play? I will mention, so first with another story, so with one proposal uh -huh. I had. So I, um, this was back when you had two resubmissions. I sent them this proposal that had two main phases. And they said, we don't get how these phases relate. It seems like you should pick one or the other. And being f young and foolish, I resubmitted it. And I just sort of tried to explain in the proposal and letter how they relate, that they're, they are related. It's a little abstract, but it really kind of follows from each other. And they said, I really, these just seem really different. You should, we like the first one better. The other one just seems less developed and they're just not related, we think. And so for the final one, back when you could do it, two resubmissions, I said, okay, clearly this second part needs to be rethought. There's much more enthusiasm for the first part. So we're, we just have the first part now. We just have the first part with the same number of years and the same amount of money. 
you're now getting half the research for the money. And they were like, great, cool, and they funded it. <laughs> so it seems like, yeah, so that's the opposite case. Um, what we did is we talked about how we, we really messed with the budget a lot. Like a few of us put less time in it. We tried to find some like efficiencies. We shifted our recruiting a little bit so it cost a little bit less. We, um, we got an extra letter for the clinic from the clinic like that had extra information about. Uh, one thing that helped us is that there was a waiting list at the time and most people who come into our, our clinic is all community based, no students. And it's you know, primarily depression and substance abuse and things. So we were able to say, well, if we just kind of just sort of try harder. But like, we're going to shift more of our money toward recruiting. We're going to shift more toward getting psychotherapists, a little bit less from us, like say in summer salary and course buyouts and um, things like that. One of our, our principal investigators heard she was going to get a sabbatical. And so she said, I have a sabbatical that's going to buy out 100% of my time. I'm going to defer it to the first year of the project so that, you know, to, to try to do things like that. So the feasibility is, is, is on the rear of mind for every proposal because like, that's the worst outcome is that the project, not that the project doesn't work, but just that it doesn't come together. And really all of these projects for the most part are recruiting children and people in the community and people who are just not like right, like you have to do something to get them to participate. You have to get in contact with them, give them money. Like we pay for transportation, we give them cell phones. Um, like, so the feasibility is always on people's mind. It's mostly resolved by having a large staff and a large budget and a lot of time and having a really good section toward the end called timeline and feasibility that just says, here's our feasibility. and just points to past work in the lab or past work the team has done and shows that you're actually trying to recruit far fewer people than you could normally get that you've seen in sort of your past research. So um, it's something to hit extremely hard. Like you definitely don't want any doubts about feasibility. This is where people tend to go slightly crazy with letters from recruiting sites. Like we want to recruit people with say some particular kind of arthritis. And we're gonna recruit from these sites. And we're going to get letters from these sites that talk about how many clients they have and how many people are eligible based on search of the records. And if we got everyone we needed, we would still only get 2% of all the eligible people. Like, you really want to like, just try to beat this into the ground very, very, very hard. Yep. Writing groups. Yes. This is our shortest and our final part. <coughs> A good way to end our day today. So we are all here, so far as we can tell. And so <laughs> the good thing to sort of end with in our, in our long day of writing is writing groups. So one of the things we know as psychologists and as people generally interested in the health sciences is that most hard things are made easier by getting together with another person and complaining about it, right? <laughs> Whining, venting, very important. I think someone, someone should do research on that. That would make like a good grant. Like whining is a kind of like protective factor or as a component of resilience. I don't know, but so venting, indeed. So people just naturally kind of self-assemble into groups when they have problems. Sometimes they go horribly wrong. Sometimes they're really helpful. Writing groups are of great interest to me because this is something that we sort of do and I get asked about a lot and you just find a lot. Like we know from, it's always slightly embarrassing for clinical psychologists to admit that most people with serious problems get better by harnessing peer support and peer influence and community support and they do pretty well without seeing a clinical psychologist. <laughs> yeah, works for me, I'm not a clinical psychologist. So you know, this is like, so. Clearly a lot can happen here. These could be like really effective. And if we t go back to the idea that writing's hard, it's frustrating, it's always gonna be challenging, it helps to have other people undergoing similar challenges who can offer some perspective and offer something to you for it. So this is what we'll end with. I will say, first off, I think something that pretty much everyone here would agree with, given what you guys do. My own sense with writing groups is like so many other kind of group-based, community-based sort of intervention things 
it really works better in a grassroots sort of sense, right? That enduring change often comes when there's grassroots interest. So institutions, such as the center, can really do much to create structures for it. But people who don't want to do it shouldn't do it. Like, it's cool. Like, it's not, I met someone in Germany once. He's like, this is fantastic. I will tell our dean. He will force us. I'm like, <laughs> you're. <laughs> Yeah, sort of like the German approach to such things tends to be a little on the more like authoritarian side. Like, if it works, yes, we will make everyone do it. I'm like, not really the idea here. So the people who want to do it, do it. People who don't, cool, right? That's cool. But I think the people who do want to do it really get a lot out of it. And this is the ones I run across. We've been one that's going on forever. I meet across ones that last very, very long. And it's always for this simple sort of grassroots kind of change that people are into it and they see value in it. It kind of works for them. And so we'll talk about briefly like a few different flavors of these writing groups because there's really like a lot. I've seen a lot that have gone really well. So I throw this out just as food for thought. So I think people will intuitively get a sense, even though they're so different, of which one might click for them. And I think your intuition will be totally right. So our first... This is what we do at UNCG. This is something that we kind of started. We have a big group that's been going on since sometime in 2003, 2004. And we call it the Agraphia Group because when you have psychologists, they over-intellectualize things. And agraphia is an actual neurocognitive disorder, which is when people lose the ability to write. And I was like, sweet, <laughs> that's us. So, you know, we seriously overthought all of this. I was like, well, what can we use from the science of motivation to help here? Goal setting, Albert Bandura, it's all there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we sort of started with a very behavior theory approach, which is funny in hindsight, because I've been the only psychologist in this group for many years. Mm -hmm. It was sort of invaded by the humanities, which is a kind of like invasive species of sorts. <laughs> and I have a lot of good pals in the humanities, and they're all writing books, and these are so painful and so hard to write. They really need help. And so we have a lot of people in architectural history. We've got a lot of people in like classical studies, religious studies, uh, history of women's classical composition, Russian women's history, just all kinds of areas for the most part. So our focus is goals. So we meet once a week and we say, what are you going to do next week? So what's your weekly goal? Because this is all harnessed onto writing schedules. So at the start of the semester, we might say, what's your writing schedule? When are you going to do it? And newcomers to the group, because anyone's really welcome, might say, writing schedule? I know not of what madness you speak. <laughs> and we sort of say, well, let us explain the madness to you. And they're like, that sounds deranged. We're like, yes, it is. So <laughs> we pick a writing schedule and we say, OK, here's what we're going to do this week. And we pick something pretty concrete. So we write down what the goal is. But really, out loud, we sort of talk about, here's what's going to happen. And the goals have to be something concrete enough so you know that you did it. So. We all kind of recognize that time our advisor asked how the thesis was going. It's like, yeah, next week I'm really going to think about that. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm spending, rather than thinking, I'm spending time sort of planning. I'm really kind of developing it, kind of elaborating on the introduction. Yeah. We're like, I'm really working on that. And really working mostly means feeling intractably guilty over not working on it. You know? So we know as psychologists, thinking bad. Like, thinking bad, trying bad. It's just, what are you going to do? So most of the goals actually really these days have just evolved to, I'm going to finish something. I'm going to write a certain number of words. So I'm going to finish a section of a manuscript. They tend to be really small. Like, I'm going to finish the results section. I'm going to write the method section start to finish. I'm going to, like people writing books are going to say, I'm going to write 1,000 words this week. I'm going to write 2,000 words this week. So they tend to be very concrete. You know if you made it or not. And then the next week, I break out the file folder because this is like this is not electronic. Because let's just say when we went sort of app-based iPad once, 
the person who had that, let's just say the iPad tended to crash and lose these goals <laughs> during weeks when the person who owned the iPad maybe didn't meet the goals. Yeah. yeah, so it's nice when you run clinical trials, you get one of these like crazy HIPAA compliant file cabinets. Yeah. Yeah, they could try to set fire to that sucker to the sky, but no, no, not gonna happen. Yeah, so um, so I keep this, I keep like a file folder. We, we do this every week. I have these going all the way back to 2004. And we just say, did you do it? Yes or no? And most people have met most of their goals, but you don't do it every week. And then you just feel this sad sense of shame. And thinking and trying bad, Shame, good. So you can sort of like, you can roll over the goal. And sometimes it gets rolled over so many times the group gives you the Ford Explorer Award. For those of you who remember those from back in the day. It helps to have like people like, like cultural anthropologists who study visual culture and things like that for these things. So, and that's it. Like this is really how it goes. You meet once a week, it takes us like 15 minutes. We meet off campus, we just say, what you gonna do? What did you do? And that's sort of it. So this is really like a goals group or an accountability group. We're not reading each other's writing or things like that. It's just keeping on track. In some ways it's really like an adjunctive intervention of sorts to the writing schedule. It's something that helps keep you going. It works really strongly based on social pressure. So we've got this, we've got this guy from interior architecture who in addition to owning an incredible collection of ties, because people in design are just like this way, and always being just a snappy dresser, he's just on. Like he's probably like 95% of the time meets these goals. And you just can't show up to this business because you know Patrick is gonna be bringing his A game. And, and so this kind of elevates the whole group. The group gets kind of hardcore. Anyone can come in any semester, it reconstitutes any semester, Anyone can come in. Some people come for a couple weeks and think, these guys are kind of creepy writing fascists. I'm like, don't come back. <laughs> Some people come in for a couple semesters, get what they need out of it, and like go onward and kind of spread the message. But so this is our approach. It has some strengths, it has some weaknesses. And that, I mean, the weakness is it's focused just on this accountability, and people who maybe need more help with development aren't going to get it there. So there are like, you know, there's some alternatives here. A variation on this that seems to be very popular with graduate students is a rewards group. <laughs> so our own graduate students in psychology started this. This is actually an, an actual banknote. I don't know if people are really interested in, in like monetary finance, but Zimbabwe did, did print $100 trillion. Um, I have one of these, and it costs like a little over $5 on eBay. So <laughs> with free shipping too. So anyway, so. So a rewards group, this is almost more of like a Boisean idea, or like a contingency management idea. This is, I think, pretty helpful when people are just kind of struggling, you know, and self-reinforcement is cool, but it really is helpful when other people are there to do it and make you feel a little ashamed or make you feel proud. So one thing uh, our grad student psychology group did is they would um, bring money. So they would meet once a week, and everyone who showed up to the meeting, the price of admission was a dollar, cash. And they had like a little bowl, and they put the money there. And if you submitted a manuscript to a journal, or submitted a grant proposal, you got the money. So about six or seven people did this each week, and it's sort of a bit like Powerball, or like statewide lotteries. <laughs> Except at much lower levels, because like, because yeah, I could just tell the students they'd be like, "There's eighteen dollars in it. <laughs> There's gonna be twenty-five next week. I'm gonna finish that thing." Like, like, that's a lot of money when you're in grad school. It's still like a lot of money. But so this kind of group sort of works. This is a fiendish idea. I've heard of other people trying this sort of thing, like added putting a little skin in the game. This made the group like f just really on fire because you just want to finish something when there's a lot of money. You feel like you're losing money that other people are getting. It just helps people finish their stuff a little faster. 
it's, it's one of these things that's irrationally motivating. It plays to a lot of sort of judgment decision biases. It's very clever. There's another group where people just brought really cool baked goods. And there wasn't anything competitive. Just people who showed up bought, brought baked goods and did much more writing, but I think created other like behavior change issues <laughs> that came from <laughs> brownies and lemon bars. And in North Carolina, I mean, this is like a whole different, whole different beast. But food for thought, you know, this is kind of like the goals group, but there's sort of maybe a little bit more behind it. The idea with the dollars, I think, is fiendish. It's so cool. It's really pretty neat. Now, a different kind that had never really occurred to me, but a lot of people have told me about, is, yeah, writing buddies. There's two flavors of these. There's the more happy, up with people kind, and then there's pulling me back from the precipice of despair kind. <laughs> these are the desperation that I have. So these are writing groups that are sort of literal, where it's usually two people, and they get together, and they write at that time. And they might get together at someone's house, or at an apartment, or at the library, or at a deserted part of the office. And they're like, we both need to write. So 9 to 11, Tuesday, Thursday, we're going to get together, and we're going to write. And the idea here is your you recognize that the will is weak. And so you're, it's based on the curious and possibly true idea that two people with really bad willpower can somehow, nevertheless, help the other person <laughs> do what they have to do. <laughs> like, I can't make myself right, you can't make yourself right. So obviously, in the two wrongs making a right theory, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, like by pooling ignorance, you can create competence, <laughs> which is in some ways a great principle for getting grant teams together, I would have to say. So, so the positive flavor is people are kind of on fire. It just kind of helps. Like people do this with exercising, and it works very well. And it's just the same idea. Let's get together. Let's write. People for whom they think this will work, it, it sort of works. I think sometimes people just need another person there to chide them like, don't check Facebook, <laughs> just write. And that, that's kind of cool. The darker flavor, though, is when really it comes like two people are very desperate. It's not going well. Uh, there was someone when I was a grad student in grad school who did this. She simply put off writing so badly she couldn't do it unless someone was there sitting next to her, forcing her to sit down and write. Now, the desperation diet approach is not sustainable in the long term. And that's not really something we encourage. But I think this is, yet, this is just another great idea. I think it's, if you use someone to do it with, you want to give it a shot, I think that sounds really great. I've known people who have been doing this a long time. It totally works. And it has this virtue. I met, um, I met someone once who was telling me about this. And we were talking about writing schedules and how to protect your writing time, especially against administrators who want you to be on like some weird, freaky committee that has nothing to do with anybody. And he said, the virtue of writing with my friend is that we each can say, oh, I'm sorry. I would love to be on the College of Arts and Sciences Enrollment Management Committee, where you fruitlessly ask for our input on how to manage undergraduate enrollment, but don't want to hear it, because we would just say, don't enroll people who can't read, and you would ignore that. <laughs> so but I, have a, I have this recurring meeting, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 9 to 11. I just can't get out of that. So in a sense, like if. That sounded, I mean, that sounded really clever. That sounded great. That some people feel have a hard time saying, I don't know, it's, it's harder to break a meeting with your writing pal than it is to break your meeting with yourself. So that actually, that seemed like a lot of real practical wisdom in that. It's kind of a cool idea. So now there's the other kind, the more traditional kind of writing group. This is like a group aimed for like, gaining feedback, a writing development group. This is where people tell you sort of how good your writing is, and people read each other's work and things like that. I will tell you, you don't see a lot of these because this takes a certain commitment in time, right? So this is where people are producing writing, um, maybe a grant proposal, and they're reading each other's proposals, each other's articles, giving them comments and feedback, maybe talking about outlines at the early stage, looking at text. This can work really well when it works, 
but I think it often fails because people want to get a writing group together and they say, let's start with this. But um, this is the highest commitment of time and energy. And given that people's biggest struggle with writing is, I don't have any time, and I got little kids, and I'm just tired, and it's like 7.45 at night, so that means it's 15 minutes past my bedtime. So, like, this is kind of hard to pull off. I will say this is the, the one that benefits the most from some sort of like institutional engagement or involvement. Like I've seen some new faculty mentoring programs where as part of the mentoring program, they'll have a writing group that meets once a month. Maybe there's a more senior writer mentor who kind of helps manage the group. And once a month, they look at each other's writing. Like this is the kind of thing that because there's a certain amount of time and commitment to it, it can really benefit from maybe some other incentives or some other structure. Because um, it's a great idea, though, if you think it'll work. But it's worth the caution of sometimes, like, we barely have time to read our own writing or the writing our graduate students are giving us. Like, to read all of each other's writing is, I don't know. But it's helpful when you really need some feedback on your writing. It is. It's really helpful. But you can do it. We use Tara Gray's method, and it was, uh, Mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes per person, everybody wrote mm -hmm. their piece and got feedback. So in one mm -hmm. hour, we were able to cover three or four pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really helpful. It really is. I, mean, I, think, I think in some ways this is something that is, for grants, extremely helpful. Like I met someone who was doing this kind of group for a group of new faculty who were all developing their first NIH proposal. So it was relatively structured. They worked on certain things each week. It was almost a little bit more like a class with a heavy peer feedback part. That was fantastic. I, I just finished it. We have a program here called Jump Start with mm -hmm. uh, the students the mm -hmm. And it's similar to that. You meet every other week for mm -hmm. a semester. Mm -hmm. And um, all the, you get feedback from the group members during the session, but there's the institutional team that also gives you mm -hmm. feedback on your work in between assignments. And it really is kind of like a class structure. But for those of you who haven't done it, it was very, it was really super useful for people. Cool. Yeah, it really is a good idea. I mean, it, it takes a lot of the effort out of that first one. So you get the first grant out, I mean, the second one's so much easier. So, yeah, it's, if, you, if it can get together, it'll be great. I will say the, the fifth, maybe the easiest and the most fun, is what the Germans would call kind of a Kaffeeklatsch group. This just means, literally translated, it means just sort of BS and gossip while having coffee. I think it's hard to... It's hard to translate clutch. Um, that's basically it. Like, just kind of drink coffee and BS and gossip. Um, but mostly, so this would be a group where you're getting together to talk about writing. So I've seen a lot of these, and these are really worth people's time. This is usually people will pick a book about writing to read, and they'll read it together, and they'll meet once a week, every couple weeks, once a month, either just to talk about how their own writing's going, to talk about this book about writing, talk about writing in general, hash out writing issues, talk about collaborations, get advice. So this is a more like general kind of thing. It's not setting goals. It's just, it's kind of a productive venting kind of group. This is just getting together, grousing, stuff like that, kind of things of that sort. Um, if people are curious to try this, one of the handouts is a list of books that I've sort of found very helpful. A lot of other people found very helpful books about writing to read. Um, food for thought. So. With that, that's sort of all I'd like to say. Um, do you have any questions I can answer? Uh, I just yes. have like a comment or question. So I yes. That these different groups that you spoke about could be useful at different stages mm -hmm. rather than uh, like simultaneously, for example. Yeah. Like oh, yeah, sure. Still yeah. Starting out, and when you, you spoke about forming a habit, mm -hmm. but it, it might be very difficult for someone to start. Like, writing for one hour continuously, or mm -hmm. when you're a first year uh, student at that time. So maybe mm -hmm. just reading about writing yeah. and might be the starting point, and then when you go to your second year and thesis writing, then you actually write, and maybe mm -hmm. when you're by your fourth year, you mm -hmm. give feedback to each other, or someone who's like your yeah. program. Yeah, that's a good idea, so yeah. So like a lifespan kind of thing of sorts. Yeah, that you can think of that there's, there's different kinds of groups that are gonna be helpful at different kind of points based on what you're working with. Um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, people could, I think this is one of those things where it's bottom up, it's grassroots, people do what works. Like this, um, this kind of group that we do, this is a great group for faculty who 
basically have the writing skills they need, they just need the poke. But a lot of these other groups are better suited, like if people really need a motivational push, you know, when people are just getting started, and also when people are kind of early on and just want to think of some big picture things to talk about writing, writing challenges. So yeah, I think people can be, people should be very eclectic with these. And if any cool hybrids come up, just sort of let me know. I actually would love to hear about it. Great. Any other kinds of questions? So I just want to add a comment that um, kind of applies to me having just been through that program with all mm -hmm. the research and selected projects. A lot of times there's resources at our own institutions that we don't even really know about. And mm -hmm. the RSP website has some great, um, some great resources and simple links that are accessible to all of us that, um, that I think we sometimes don't think we check. So they yes. have, you know, they have some brown bag theories and some um, different topics. Some of them are open, like you can come and just show up with a draft you're working on and they'll give you feedback on it. So um, just that's kind of aside from the writing groups, but that, mm -hmm. but sometimes just to check the people who are, who are out there doing, supporting our grant writing or research efforts. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I was part of a writing group for three or four years, and all, everybody got tenure. Everybody mm -hmm. got tenure, and then those that were tenure track learned from those who got tenure. Mm -hmm. And then they asked mm -hmm. me to help start writing groups in the Department of Education. Cool. And then I started four writing groups, and they're still meeting, and they're being published, and now they're going out for tenure. Great. So when you Great. learn something, you can teach someone else mm -hmm. to do it. And if you want me to come talk to your group, I, what I've learned is you have to be kind of in your, we, we work in different fields, but if it's too different, people don't know how to give you feedback because mm -hmm. it's just so out mm -hmm. of the league. Mm -hmm. And also, once people are tenured, they're not always as incentivized to write. <laughs> so we realized that we were, yeah, sometimes they were our leaders because they were elders and we respected mm -hmm. them, but they were the ones who were placed on the, the tenure track. Mm -hmm. So when you're tenure track, you need to produce. So mm -hmm. I think you have to be equally motivated to want to produce, and that will help you work. And then people who want to see you succeed. Mm -hmm. They want to see you succeed and you invest in those relationships and want to help each other in collegial ways. So that mm -hmm. happens with grad students, it can happen with faculty, mm -hmm. or people who are like-minded. Those are great. And I would argue that um, three to five, maybe three to five people per writing group, because if someone misses, it's okay. You still have, you're still functional. Mm -hmm. But if only two people show up, um, and, and also the, you have to develop a thick skin, <laughs> and we have one colleague who has very, very low self-esteem. So any feedback, she's like, <gasps> and start crying. Like, so you can't <laughs> work like that. That you was know, me. I just said. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, oh my gosh, she needs therapy. You know, but we didn't know how to help her. Um, so you have to see, we're, we're invested in each other. We want to make it work. Let's mm -hmm. figure it out. And there's groups that are still going forward. That's, and that's incredible. And, mm -hmm. and so they'll see me and they're like, you came in three years ago and you helped us get started. I'm like, okay, what's cool. you did, you know? But those are like cool. great, great, great uh, testimonies yeah. because they work. We mm -hmm. just have to figure ways to find people that will help exactly. us. Exactly. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. I actually, I did, there's other questions. I just want to thank everyone for coming. Like this is much more than the usual time commitment y'all took for writing today. And I mean, thanks first for having me. It's actually enjoy to come and talk about writing. But also just, just thanks for coming and for, for taking part and being active for such a long time. Because I think it's two o'clock. And we all came here on 8.30. So you guys are awesome. And again, thanks. Thank you.